Good morning. It has been a pleasure driving up this last few weeks uh, up here to uh, Pratt or across the state to Pratt or however we call that. So I've enjoyed meeting some of you. I am trying to remember your names, so um, please correct me if I'm wrong, but you, you guys are a great people. I don't know exactly what God has in store for you yet, but I know it's going to be good. Can we stand on that promise? Amen. Today I'm going to start, uh, 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 have a different message. We've had a series for the last three weeks, and I'm going to move on to something else. And I'm going to title this uh, sermon, A Place of Refuge. A Place of Refuge. Now, I'm a news junkie, okay? I, I was a newspaper boy when I was young. So I read the newspaper before anyone ever got it delivered to their house. Um, I read the online editions now. I don't read the papers much. I catch the evening broadcasts when I can. I go to we the Weather Channel or Fox News to when there's breaking stories to find out what's going on. And every story I read over the past few years or newscast I hear or Twitter update or Facebook post, I begun to see that there's something in common. They're talking about people that need something, people that need safety. Maybe it's people uh, fleeing drug cartels coming across the border or, or refugees from Afghanistan who had supported our troops there being relocated into, in the heartland. Or, or maybe it's refuge from COVID-19 or whatever it is. People are looking for a place of safety. And maybe it's not even those big global things. Maybe it's just um, something locally, like maybe a, a battered woman needing a place to stay, someone who is homeless, needing shelter from the scathing winds, a, a, a child scared and neglected, seeking help from a foster agency. Humanity is seeking safety. Who will save us? Humanity is seeking safety. Who will save us? This is the question that has been cried out by people across the ages, not just today, but who will save us? If you're able to stand with me, I, I want to read our text today, which comes from Joshua chapter 24. Uh, it's a little longer passage I'm going to read today. It's Joshua chapter 24, starting with verses 1 through 3, and then jumping through 14 to 25. Because I think this passage talks about safety, a place of refuge. I'll be reading from the English Standard Version, the ESV today. Verse 1, Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and summoned the elders, the heads, and the judges, and the officers of Israel. And they presented themselves before God. And Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Long ago your fathers lived beyond the Euphrates, Terah, the father of Abraham and of Nahor, and they served other gods. But then I took your father Abraham from beyond the river and led him through all the land of Canaan, and I made his offspring many. I'm going to jump down to verse 14. Feel free to read the rest of the chapter at home today. It's really good. But starting with verse 14. Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your father served beyond the river and in Egypt, and serve the Lord. And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your father served in the region beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Then the people answered, Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For it is the Lord our God who brought us and our fathers up from the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, and who did these great signs in our sight and preserved us in all the way that we went and among all the peoples from whom we passed. And the Lord drove out before us all the peoples, the Amorites who lived in the land, Therefore, we will also serve the Lord, for he is our God. Verse 19. But Joshua said to the people, You are not able to serve the Lord, for he is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions or your sins, because if you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, then he will turn and do you harm and consume you 
after having done you good. And the people said to Joshua, no, but we will serve the Lord. Then Joshua said to the people, you are witnesses against yourselves that, we, that you have chosen the Lord to serve him. And they said, we are witnesses. Joshua said, then put away the foreign gods that are among you and incline your heart to the Lord, the God of Israel. And the people said to Joshua, the Lord, our God, we will serve and his voice we will obey. So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day and put in place statutes and rules for them at Shechem. Heavenly Father, I give you thanks for your word that you have given to us from generation to generation to protect our hearts, to teach us your paths, to shine a light upon us so that we come, come into a greater relationship with the God who loves us, who has endless love for us. I pray today as we study your word that you would speak to our hearts, you would change us, you would transform us, you would set us into new paths and new places. May we always serve you. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. You may have a seat. Let me set the scene here. In case you aren't as familiar with some of these First Testament passages, the first character in this drama is old, wise, weathered in years. And one can imagine his visage. His body, while stooped, barely obscured his countenance and the passion that burned deep within him. Once a young apprentice, now the elder statesman. His name, Joshua. That's what they call him now. No one actually remembers the name that his mama called him. And he's okay with that. Because Joshua, in the Hebrew, is Yeshua. And his new name gives him hope. His old name was Hosea. It, it, it's a cry of hope, but just means salvation. And, and salvation is good, but where is salvation coming from? Who will save us? His new name, not the one given to him when he was still in captivity in Egypt as a young boy, but his new name, the one that he's been called the last 80 years, reminds him daily of his coming Savior. Because the divine name of God is etched upon him. Yeshua. Yahweh, or Jehovah, is my salvation. His new name means the Lord is my salvation. Salvation is not coming to me from anywhere else. It's not coming to me from any other gods. It's not coming to me by anything that I can do. It's coming from the Lord because God is my hope. God is my Savior. And as for me and my house, Joshua said, we will serve the Lord. As for me and my house, Joshua said, we will serve the Lord. And his name reflected his life. His name reflected his actions. His name was his legacy, a daily sacrifice, a living testimony to the nation of Israel. See, I love testimonies. I love to see what God has done in people's lives when he's taken them from point A to point B, when he's taken them from a life of mess to a life of greatness, They've taken them from a, a messed up situation and given them new clothes cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. And Joshua had seen it all. You see, Joshua had been there since the early days. He walked out of Egypt with Moses. He walked through the fertile valleys of Canaan, and he proclaimed it right for the taking then he had to wait for 40 agonizing years for an entire generation to pass away who had opted not to stay in the place of refuge that God was providing them, but instead chose to wander through the desert. Joshua crossed the Jordan. He led the conquest. He received the promise of salvation. He wrote some laws. He enforced statutes. And finally, one of the last things he did is he established safe places. And the, and the writers of the Pentateuch here call these six cities a place of refuge. Places where one could seek salvation, where one could find hope. Geographical locations scattered throughout the tribal regions where accidental sins could be forgiven, where grace could be shown and lives could be restored. People could seek salvation. When everyone was against them, they could go there because there they could call upon the name of the Lord and the Lord would answer them. And Shechem was one of these cities. Shechem was designated a place of refuge. It's a place if you needed God, you could go. 
Shechem was located 40 miles north of Jerusalem, fortified by a natural landscape, fed by underground aquifers, surrounded by a fertile plain, and this conquered Canaanite city controlled the trade routes all around, held the ruins of an ancient temple. The nation of Israel had taken this former vassal of an Egyptian empire. But unlike several of the early battles which resulted in the complete destruction of the native peoples, the peoples of this place did not violently oppose the people of Israel or their God. So pagan cultic rituals and other foreign gods were openly worshipped in this town. But this was a special place. It was here that Abraham at Shechem had purchased a burial plot. It was here at Shechem that the bones of Jacob transported from bondage in Egypt were finally laid to rest. And it was here that Joshua got up here at the end of that, Joshua 24, and he's making his dying declaration now, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And he couples that with his interrogation of the people who have gathered there. Who will you choose to offer you salvation? Who will you find refuge in? See, Joshua was not content with what the work he had done that God had led him to do. He wanted to see this pass on generation to generation. He wanted to see the next crew rise up and take the reins and proudly proclaim, I serve Jesus. I serve Yeshua. I serve our coming Messiah. And this is what Joshua knew. When you chose God's sacred covenant, God provides everlasting protection from generation to generation. You see, when you accept God's offer of salvation and His grace, He commits to you. Jesus commits to you. We sang that song earlier today in worship, Reckless Love. Jesus will chase you down. There's no obstacle that can get in His way because He loves you. He wants you to find a place of safety. He wants you to find a place of refuge. So this is my first point that I'm going to put up on the screen today. If you want to find refuge in His presence, respect the call. Respect the call and you will find refuge in His presence. You see, Joshua had put out a call for a sacred assembly. That's what this chapter is about. He called the leaders. He called the elders. He called the deacons. He called the Sunday school teachers. He called the church superintendents. He called the officials. He called the judges. He called the innovators. He called the groundbreakers. He called the planet shakers. He called the young men who had visions. And he called the old men who had seen things. He called the women. He called them all. And he calls you because he wants us to overcome obstacles and hurdle challenges. And he called them to this special place, this place of refuge. Joshua probably even had the Ark of the Covenant and the tabernacle move there that day. You know, just because you're called doesn't mean you have to come. There are too many people that hear the call and they don't step out and go. But this time the people did. They respected the call. They heard the call. They showed up at this place of safety and they entered into God's presence. Because for them, Shechem re represented a place of forgiveness, a place of worship, a place where sins could be forgiven, a place where they could encounter God fresh one more time. And this is my dream whenever any congregation, whether it's any church I've ever been at, that when the people of God, when the people who call them followers of Jesus, get together, that this would be a place that God's Holy Spirit comes down and dwells among us. And when I, I, want, to, I want the people that hear this message today to realize that God is calling you too, even in this day, to come and worship Him and to be forgiven. This image that's presented in this chapter is a foreshadowing of what the church is to be. We are to be that safe place in a dying world. We are a place of refuge from those buffeted by the forces of evil, a shelter for those tormented by past sins where forgiveness can reign. We are to be a house of worship, a place of praise, a garden of prayer. We gather in this place of uh, refuge, this sanctuary, to take safety in the presence of our God and our King. And here in His presence, our fears melt away, our nightmares can cease, and the peace that passes all understanding and all knowledge takes root in the innermost parts of our heart. Respect the call, and you will find refuge in His presence. 
That's why when the leaders of this assembly cause the church to pray, you pray. When the prompting of the Holy Spirit causes you to go forward and, and speak a word of life, of witness into somebody, you witness. And when the power of the Holy Spirit welcomes the outsider, the stranger, the refugee, the person who is seeking safety into our, in our mix, we embrace them with the full love of Jesus Christ and His grace. Respect the call. Another thing that, that, that Joshua did here in this passage is he remembered the past victories. We didn't read all those middle verses, verses 4 through 13, but it talks about some of the victories. Remember the past victories. We sang this morning as we opened up worship, victory in Jesus. Folks, there are times I need to remember the victory because there are days that I get down. Does anybody feel me? There are days when I don't know if I have the confidence. I don't know if what I did messed everything up. I don't know if I'm, I'm doing all the right things. I need to know that there is a point where Jesus called me and, and I had the victory in Jesus and that no matter the circumstances, he will overcome. And I do that best by remembering what God has done for me in the past, what God has done for us in the past, and not just for me or my parents or my grandparents, but the generations of people throughout church history. Remember the past victories, and you will find refuge in the conquering deliverer. Remember the past victories, and you will find refuge in the conquering deliverer. Joshua, in this passage, relates all the different things that had to happen, the miracles that had to happen, Jericho and Ai, and you keep going down the list. How in the world did they even get into this land 40 years ago? The text lists battle after battle, victory after victory, and in a brief passage, the entire summarized history of the people of Israel is related. And bondage, they were freed, brought out of Egypt, king after king defeated. And when there was no way, God provided a way. Whom needs a way from God today? When there's no way, God provided a way. Some trust in chariots, some in horses. But I will trust in the name of the Lord my God. See, I remember that day many years ago now when I first asked about God's grace. I accepted Jesus Christ in my heart as five, at five years old. Keep pushing children's ministries. Keep pushing uh, reaching out to the children of Pratt because God can take a five-year-old and do great things. I recall the day that God spared my life as our church bus on the way to a Royal Ranger camp, a powwow camp out slid over the side of the freeway embankment and flipped and rolled and rolled and we were being tossed to ground. God saved our lives that day. I know of the financial provision that somehow always appeared whenever the desperation really got going. I'm going, God, how's this going to happen? God provided in ways that I could not have even imagined. I rejoice when I give a bear hug to a man coming out of the waters of baptism free from bondage of drugs and alcohol and making a public proclamation. I love it when a young woman proclaims her public statement of faith. And I know from Revelation it is by the word of our testimonies that we shall overcome. So I remember our past victories. And when I am down, I remember what the Lord has done. My friends, He has never failed me yet and He will not fail you. If we had time to recount all the stories and all the signs and wonders, we would become convinced that God's promises are ever true. We could spend days talking about the good things that God has done and the good things that God is doing, and even better yet, the good things that God will do in you. As for me and my house, I will serve the Lord. Reach Church, as for you and Reach Church, I will serve the Lord. We will serve the Lord. My next point, recapture the promise of future possibilities. Recapture the promise of future possibilities. If you want to find refuge, recapture the promise. See, the story could have ended there. Joshua could have given his farewell speech. The band could have played and everybody could have gone home. Israel could have sat back and go, oh, remember those good old days. All the great things that grandpa and grandma and great grandma and grandma had. Oh, we did good, didn't we? They could sit on their success. We face the same question today because every generation does. 
Our churches today have seen a lot of history. And we should celebrate our history, but it cannot end there. Because we are still to be a place of safety. We are still to be a place of refuge. The history of Israel did not end with the burial of Joshua because the story continued. And therefore, your story, this church's story, our fellowship story, the Christian story throughout this, this land, this country, and, the, and this world must continue. The promise made to Abraham carries down throughout salvation history and applies to this church today. The offspring promised to him in, in Exodus 12 and 15 includes those who have not yet heard the gospel. We have a role to play in our community to witness. We have a role to play with our missionaries around the world. We still have a great part to play in reaching the people in this area. See, I, I am convinced. I've only been here four Sundays, but I am convinced that there are greater things for this church to come. I'm convinced of that in my heart. No, I'm not saying it's going to be easy. I'm not going to say it might not be hard work. I'm not, I might, I'm not saying it might not be different. I don't know. But I do know that the God who has brought you to this point is going to carry you on forward. Whatever God is already orchestrating in the heavens according to his divine will and plan, the possibilities are endless. I do not know. So if you want to find safety, if you want to find refuge, if you want to be in the middle of his will, then the best place is to be in the middle of his plan. So recapture the promises that he has for you. The scriptures following their text, going on into the last little bits of the book of Joshua, and then on into Judges, turns to the exploits of those judges. You may know their names, Samson. Maybe not me. Deborah. Gideon. Each of them doing something new something different, answering the call, providing refuge to the people of God, putting into action the different variables that would end up resulting in the birth of our Savior centuries later. You see the promise that God gave Abraham, the promise that we are heirs to, that promise has never faded. It remains as true as the day it was given. It echoes all throughout the day of Pentecost. It's etched in the foundation of our, our fellowship, the assemblies of God. So do not be afraid of the future, because as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. The next point I want to lift from this passage is renew your commitment. Renew your commitment and you will find refuge in a forgiving Redeemer. Renew your commitment and you will find refuge in the forgiving Redeemer. Lest we get caught up in all the feel-good excitement and emotion of the moment, Joshua decides to toss out a wrench into the mix. He gives us a caution and a warning that applied not just to them that day, but to us all. It's been uh, almost 20 years ago, I had the pleasure of officiating the 35th renewal ceremony of my parents' wedding. And while I was doing that, and and. and I do this probably every time my anniversary comes up, when I remember it's my anniversary. Um, I, I reflect on my own wedding from years before. Two poor kids. Can't believe we were just teenagers when we got together. Scrapping together monies for invitations, a dress, and a ring. And then all the marital spats that ensued, we quickly realized that the relationships that each of our parents had with each other, both well over 50 years married now, had taken a lot of work and took years to mature. Marriage is not something anyone should ever enter into lightly. And a commitment to God requires the same. And Joshua threw that out there with them, and he said, count the cost. Do not be too quick to commit without thinking, because the easy thing is, yes, I'm going to serve the Lord because we all are going to serve the Lord. Yay, woohoo, and then go off and not do anything different. There's a price to pay. Because Jacob had brought them to Shechem for a purpose. There were other places of refuge that they could have gone to. But he brought them to Shechem to throw into sharp relief the power of the one true God and the practice of pagan worship that was still in that community. 
See, it's, it's one thing to learn how to live in a mixed culture. It's another thing to assimilate into the advanced technology comforts of our contemporary society. And then it's a completely different thing to worship even the gods of this culture. Joshua was concerned. When everybody else is so easy to follow other gods, will you really serve God? Have you leaders already given up the talismans? that could distract you? Are you determining what is evil in your own eyes? Does the standard for morality rest upon a holy God or on whatever culture says is good? See, these verses that we read in 14 through 25, this is the fine print time. You know, the little 10-point font that you never read. God demands our attention. We are required to listen to him. There is no room... In God's kingdom for someone that, well, maybe I want to serve this God this day and serve God uh, and serve the Lord another day. Anything that exists that takes our eyes off of God, that takes our faith off of him, that calls into uh, uh, question the promise that he has given us, anything that does that, um, whatever it is, those things, those distractions are idols. We don't worship golden calves or statues anymore, but boy, we have a lot of other things that become distractions. Jobs, careers, reputations, social media, church sometimes. There are plenty of things, especially in our culture, that can take our eyes off of Jesus and lure us away from that place of safety into the other things that are around And the fine print continues. The consequences for disobedience are clearly spelled out. Those who walk outside of God's protection can risk everything. But even in there, even when we walk away, God is willing to bring us back to safety. Oh, that reckless love of God. Oh, yeah, we got consequences, but he chases us down, doesn't he? He brings us back. The leaders of Israel affirmed that they would abide by God's covenant, and they vowed their own selves as witnesses. The leaders that day were exhibiting what we call accountability. Together, they would help each other. Do not try to serve Jesus alone, folks. It ain't going to work. Our responsibility in our congregation is to help our brothers and our sisters, to pray for them, to offer wise counsel, and at times gently, and let me say gently, as James writes, confess your sins one to another. Acknowledge your limitations. Because only in our weaknesses is the Lord made strong. Together, together, we can accomplish the plans and see the promises of God. Together, we can huddle in the safety of our Savior. Yes, we as humans are bound to fail. Even in our best accountable settings, we are not good enough by our own means. Humanity cannot will ourselves to be perfect. It just, I've tried, it doesn't work. We will never be able to maintain our own goodness. We will often break that contract, just as Israel as a nation eventually often did. But the love of God, because the refuge of the Father's arms is not limited because we sin. He loves us despite our sin, and he comes after us. You see, the covenant that Joshua is remembering here actually can never be broken, even when we fail, live up to our, when we fail to live up to our obligations. I've talked about Genesis 12 through 15 being the promise that God makes to Abraham. But guess what? It was never a promise between Abraham and God. It was a promise between God and God. God was the witness to the promise. We are just the blessed recipients. So no matter whatever Abraham did to mess up, God was still going to enact his story and that he was going to redeem Abraham. And just like that today, no matter how often we mess up, God is still there to redeem us because God's covenant is, after, is everlasting. It has to be appropriated by each generation. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. After the cost has been counted and the witness is called, there's only one thing to do. Recite the vow and you will find refuge. Recite the vow and you will find refuge. You see, the vow that I'm talking about is not a magical formula. It's a life decision. 
standing in the shadow of other foreign false gods at Shechem, Joshua explicitly spells out what must be done for the people of God to remain in the covenant relationship with their protector. Forsake all others. Do not follow other gods. Get rid of everything that reminds you and that can be a distraction and a stumbling block of your old fatalistic life. Incline your heart towards God. Develop a relationship with the Creator. Seek out His attributes and emulate them. Develop love and joy and peace. Be transformed into His image by the renewing of your mind. Let the center of your being reflect Him. When my wife and I got married maybe 30 years ago, something like that, that was just the beginning of our relationship. I'm not quite sure that we would have ever gotten married had we realized all the difficulties that we would run into over our lives. But through those difficulties and through those issues, we became closer together. We learned to work closer together. We learned to love each other deeper and more. See, getting married is just the beginning of a relationship. It's not the end. And that's the same thing with our relationship with Christ. Coming forward in salvation to an altar and saying, God, I turn my life to you, or God, at my house, we will serve the Lord, is just the beginning. It's not the end. He wants us to obey his voice. Obedience is better than sacrifice. God wants a relationship with us. He wants us to listen to that still, small whisper. He wants us to heed the raging storm because God has a message for us. And you will hear it when you are in a place of refuge, when you are in a safe place. The vow is a choice. The moment of a decision before a lifelong commitment. Will you follow in the footsteps of Joshua? Can you say, for me and my house, will we serve the Lord? And when we do, we find refuge under his wings. In conclusion, if you want to find refuge, we've talked a few points. Respect the call. Remember the past victories. Recapture the promise of future possibilities. Renew your commitment. Recite the vow. The last one is rejoice in the covenant. Rejoice in the covenant. Joshua reminded the new generation of his day of the old covenant, the one promised to Abraham and celebrated each year at the commemoration of the Exodus, the Passover. The time when the, the lamb was slain and blood was splayed upon the doorpost and the, the angel passed over and the people packed and the bread didn't have time to rise in the oven on the race out of Egypt. It is this covenant that Joshua remembers he would have been a young boy that transition from slavery to salvation. From slavery to salvation. This tradition that must be passed down from generation to generation, a reminder that there was a cost to our freedom, a reminder that someday the full redemption would be repaid, a reminder that our own Lord celebrated this tradition in Jerusalem the week that he was betrayed. And Joshua recorded the vow of the Israelite leaders on a tablet. He built a monument so that they would have a place there in Shechem, in that place of reference to go see, that they would never forget this ultimate grandfather clause. And may it never be forgotten by us. Let it be written on the tablet of our hearts. And let our testimonies record a new story so that we too can sing victory in Jesus. May we celebrate a new covenant. May we find refuge and healing and salvation. And then we can say together, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Everybody repeat that with me. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. One more time. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I'm going to ask the worship team to come back up here. And uh, I'm going to ask you to play that last song, actually. Um, Jesus, we come, or whatever that was that we just sang. My last slide today is remember this. When you choose God's sacred covenant, God provides everlasting protection from generation to generation. When you choose God's sacred covenant, God provides everlasting protection from generation to generation.
Joshua is there at the beginning of the tradition of celebrating the covenant. He experienced firsthand the power of God's protection upon his people. We too have the privilege of experiencing the power of God upon his people. Shall we pray?